because I'm going to tell some stories that talk, talk about the same issues from maybe the other side of the fence, the computer side side of the fence. Um, I want to talk to you today about auditing algorithms and um, Andy's perspective is one that I heartily endorse, as you'll see from the comments that I'm going to make here when I figure out how to advance the slides. There we go. So um, I guess I don't really need to belabor the point that uh, algorithms are increasingly hitting us in society from all sides, that the, our experience in daily life is being increasingly moderated, shaped uh, by algorithms in particular. Um, sorry. I'm... Some operator error here, pardon me. Okay, I'll just look at the screen. And so, you know, we've got um, some classic examples that I'm sure you've heard of uh, algorithms like the compass algorithm that is used, has been used in uh, various jurisdictions to assess the risk of recidivism among um, in um, court systems. Uh, and, here, you know, a good, a, a, classic example of the problems that these systems bring to us are is illustrated by the fact that the compass system itself, after an independent investigation, was found to be making errors in a way that was strongly correlated with the race of the individual who was being evaluated. Um, how does this happen? It happens because these algorithms can inherit biases from their training uh, data um, or the goals that are designed into the algorithm. Um, and when we think about how to address this algorithm, we immediately, this problem, we immediately run up against the problem these algorithms are typically not transparent. We can't easily understand why many of these systems make the decisions that they do. The classic phrase that's used is that inside these algorithms, there's no logic, there's just ginormous inscrutable matrices. What do they mean? How do these uh, collections of millions or billions of parameters turn into decisions? It's extremely hard to, to determine in many cases. So my claim today is that uh, for technical reasons, as well as social reasons, we need to audit algorithms. We do not have the opportunity in many cases to directly inspect the logic inside algorithms. We need to look at them from the outside and ask whether they're performing in ways that are conform to our social goals. So this is something we have to do essentially from the outside. So I'm just gonna tell you uh, some uh, stories about efforts that we've engaged in here to uh, perform audits, exploring the auditing, the, the mechanisms of auditing, and uh, ways of designing algorithms for auditing. In other words, strategies for auditing other algorithms. With the eventual goal in each case of trying to improve the social impacts of these systems that we're uh, living with every day. So, okay, uh, how many of you used YouTube? Oh, come on, I know you, yeah, okay, good. I know you've used YouTube. So when you use YouTube, of course you watch a video and on the right side of the screen, you've probably noticed YouTube always gives you a set of recommendations. They're usually ranked or you can think of them as ranked. What is YouTube trying to do? It's trying to keep you on the platform, encourage you to watch another video. In fact, you can turn on an option that just causes it to just simply go to the next video that it's recommending for you. And you could sit there all day without touching the screen and it would show you video after video, right? So what happens when you watch these videos? We ask the question, if we follow the recommendations that YouTube gives us, what kind of content do we become exposed to? Where do these recommendations lead? So uh, you can look at, sorry, you can look at uh, what I'm showing you here are some paths 
that you can imagine through a space of content. So imagine that we take the kinds of channels that YouTube exposed you to, and we go through them and laboriously allocate their content to one of three categories, either trustable, coming from a trustworthy news source, or extreme, um, seeking to, um, to deny established knowledge, incite hate, or promote fake news, or something in between, neutral. Okay, I'm gonna move more quickly. What this is showing you is that we're, we move very quickly from a space of trustable content into a space of extreme content in a small number, relatively small number of clicks, oftentimes three or four or five clicks, and you've moved very far into the space. Uh, in light of time, I'm gonna move faster and I'm gonna talk to you about algorithms for data minimization. What is data minimization? It takes it, when we think about machine learning algorithms, we recognize how data hungry they are. They're always looking for larger and larger data sets. But what is need to know for an algorithm? What should we consider to be valid requests from an algorithm for our data? Should you have to disclose, disclose highly personal information in order to get a loan? The question is how can we define this, this, this notion of algorithmic overreach and uh, formalize it? There is a, a law in Europe called GDPR that says that personal data should be limited to what is necessary to the purposes for which they are processed. That the algorithm should not be asking for data information that's not needed for the question at hand. But how do we know? How do we know whether the request for data on the loan form is asking for information that's really needed. So we worked on operationalizing this concept and formally defining what this means. The basic idea is to ask whether the system's decision is affected by the value of the input that it's asking for. So we think of a system as a, a black box that's making requests for the data on the left coming from and it's trained on uh, typical data. And then we imagine an auditor who comes along with access to more of that data, who can ask the system by holding back some information, whether its decisions are gonna change if information was held back. And turning this into an efficient algorithm was uh, our challenge and goal. And the last thing I wanna talk about is just ongoing work right now. So we're currently looking at the question of how people evaluate large language models. So everyone has probably heard of the revolution in large language models. It's represented by ChatGPT and it's kin, but probably people are not so aware that there are um, millions. There's going to be millions of these large language models. They're incredibly flexible and they can be easily tuned to various purposes. It's not, unreasonable to imagine that each of us in the near future will have our own personal large language model that will know a lot about us, that will have been trained for the kinds of questions we need to answer and the kinds of problems we face. So how then do we as users evaluate the potential of a large language model, assess it, ask whether it's, it contains biases that may be undesirable? Even now there's, only, there's already 300,000 large language models available. The current methods that are used in the machine learning community are quite, in some ways, one dimensional. They look at accuracy on tests. What we're trying to do is understand whether the methods that are being used to evaluate these models are actually valuable methods in themselves, whether the audits are truly testing the models correctly. And for this, we're turning essentially to the world of psychology and psychometrics where this question has been asked about human brains for the last hundred years. Okay, that's all I have, thanks.